well, thanks to President Ian for inviting me today. Um, so the goal of this seminar is, uh, uh, first of all, to give you a little introduction of, of who we are out at IEDR, and then to describe some of the uh, sort of uh, research that's been going on at NIST and at IEDR for well over the past 10 years. So I'm going to be representing the work of a number of members of the, of the group. Um, so. Uh, it's not necessarily uh, all my work, but, but the group's efforts in this area. Uh, but there's a general, uh, in, in the group, first of all, to just point out, as Ian mentioned, I'm, we're in the biomolecular structure and function group, so we're interested in, in developing measurement science, and because we're NIST uh, standards, when appropriate, to understand uh, molecular structure uh, and, and, and sort of with applications that can be useful for, for practical uh, practical things like drug discovery or drug colonization. Um, so the other thing we're interested in is understanding or pushing down sort of the forefront where there's, um, where technology is really limited in terms of, of discovery. So if there's a measurement bottleneck that's limiting biological discovery, uh, that's sort of a sweet spot for NIST to come in and sort of decide what kind of measurement tools we can sort of try to develop to help advance a field uh, and, and open up new possibilities for new biological discoveries. So hopefully, and our group uh, is has always, I've not always been the group leader, but the group has always been part of Maryland. It's part of the site out at Shady Grove, and uh, you'll see at the end of the slide, uh, everyone will be welcome if they want to come out and visit us out in Rockville. Uh, we'd like to have visitors and have tours. So um, that said, I'll launch into the talk now. So. So what are, what are we interested in? I said we're interested in developing measurement science technologies for, for areas where there's gaps. And there's probably no greater gap in, in structure analysis uh, in, in biology than membrane proteins. It's a frontier of structural biology. And there, it's sort of, I like to think of it as an inverse relationship. So membrane proteins are sitting in these lipid bilayers and serve as the material and information gateways to the cell. So they control signaling, transport across cell membranes, and they're very critical for, for uh, cellular function. And, but because they sit in these bilayers, they sit at the interface between an aqueous and a sort of greasy uh, uh, environment. And that, the crux of it, makes these very challenging proteins to, to express and to, uh, to reconstitute the study structurally and functionally. Um, again, the motivations are pretty extreme. About 30% of the genome is membrane proteins. These are pretty much left off the table in all the NIH programs to develop well, high throughput protein structure determination. There's still just a, a, a percent or so of unique protein structures that are membrane proteins in the gene, in the actual PDB, which bank, uh, has a bank of all the protein structures. And again, as I already emphasized, this is uh, due to sneak significant uh, technical challenges at many levels uh, to routine study. So what else uh, to point out is that in addition to being uh, critical for understanding biology, uh, as NIST, we're part of the Department of Commerce, so we're interested in supporting uh, uh, commercial activities. Uh, there's uh, certain sectors of the environment, uh, commercial sectors broadly, in this case the biopharmaceutical research and development, so again, because they're essential to so many biological processes, immune response, I list some of them here, neurotransmission, cell adhesion, growth differentiation, they're actually the target of, of a, many, many drug development programs uh, related to many different diseases where these proteins could, could go awry or where you could use it as uh, targets for infectious disease. So the GPCR class alone, which is a, a probably the most uh, important class of receptor proteins in our body. Uh, there's a number of blockbuster drugs uh, from various companies that treat various, uh, various diseases. So what are the, what's the measurement science that needs that are being, need to be addressed here? So again, anybody who's worked with membrane proteins, this is not a, an unfamiliar list. The first issue is, is making functional protein. Uh, that's not something that we focused on, but it's really, I, I don't like to leave that away because that's really critical to actually being able to, to really enable studies of these kinds of proteins. The other problem, which, which is now somewhat being uh, uh, 
not quite front and center any longer is these proteins are functionally dynamic. So there's now a lot of beautiful crystal structural data. Uh, this is, for example, the crystal structure of the, the adrenergic receptor with its, its G protein bound, cover of nature. But these proteins are actually not static. And so dealing with the fluidity of the membrane and the, which these are again done in detergent solubilization form, so this is sort of a cartoon. Uh, so you have to, under to understand their full function, you need to understand how, they, how they're dynamically moving in addition to what their, these sort of snapshot crystallographic pictures can show us. So the other thing is detergent solubilization can uh, sometimes trap a state that's not particularly active. And oftentimes to get crystal structures of these proteins, uh, significant uh, engineering goes into the proteins where they add domains for stabilization, they crystallize them with antibodies to again stabilize the proteins. And so you don't have the true native state of the protein in the bilayer, okay? So what's our goal here is, is again, not to sort of start from the crystal structures and ask the question from a structural biology perspective is can we develop high enough resolution methods that can leverage the crystal structures that are, again, for the most part, done in detergent solubilized forms of these proteins and, and describe structures or, or inform structural behavior in native life membranes. So the talk is just an outline of the talk. I first want to go through, again, some of the efforts in the group. Most of this is ongoing work. Uh, the first part of the talk will be to discuss some of our uh, work on tethered bilayer membrane systems. So I'm going to focus, there's a number of avenues we're taking as approaches to this, but today's talk I'd like to focus on the solid support surface uh, uh, tethered bilayers, uh, uh, perhaps because they may be of greatest interest to sort of people interested in, in, in MEMS or other kinds of engineering efforts. And then uh, talk about some functional characterization methods for these surface TBLMs and protein reconstituted TBLMs that, that we, uh, we're working with in the group. And then uh, talk about some of the structural methods that we're employing to sort of uh, understand the structures of these proteins in the bilayers. And there I'll focus primarily, again, we're doing lots of different things with the uh, main thrust of the, of the program is to look at neutron scattering methods, uh, reflectometry, and I'll show you some examples of those where they've actually been able to inform structural behavior of proteins in these bilayer, uh, native bilayer-like uh, membranes, which uh, again allow us to understand how protein structures uh, can change or how they can interact with the membrane and support the function. So to start off with, uh, this fellow over here is Dave Vandrott. He's our uh, chemist in the group, and he's been working for a number of years to develop the chemistries to develop tethered uh, bilayers. So what I'm going to tell you about is that the, the bilayers, what we like to develop is a, a, a bilayer system on a solid support that's sparsely tethered on, on gold as our, as our coupling agent. So the idea would be to come up with a, uh, uh, a you know a system where you can reconstitute, you know, assuming again that the crystallization of these proteins uh, may never be possible, particularly in the presence of the lipids, uh, can you come up with a sort of a robust way to, constant, to generate a, a general platform for uh, bilayer reconstruction? So they said his approach is the synthetic approach where he's focused on optimizing tethered uh, lipid tethers to generate these floating bilayers. And then again, to create a platform and such that you can then take these kind of self-assembled bilayers and port them into our particular structural measurements, whether they be neutrons or other electrochemical or surface plasma resonance fluorescence or, or what have you. So this is a picture um, before I get into the details of the of the idea of the bilayer. So the idea is on a solid gold surface is to assemble a floating bilayer which would mimic the cell bilayer that's again self-assembled in this case uh, with, with the lipids and at the bottom is you have your tethered molecules. So what the tethers are you'll see is a series of uh, basically lipids that are linked through ethylene oxide linkages to a sulfur atom that then can react with the gold surface. And then through a mixture of these tethered molecules together with uh, beta metallic <coughs> ethanols, these small molecules here can create spacers. We can create fluidic, fluidic spaces, uh, uh, aqueous spaces below the membrane so that we have an aqueous layer here, a lipid bilayer here, and then an aqueous space on the bottom to allow proteins to, to stick through. 
So here are the uh, close-up of the tethered lipid molecules that Dave's actually synthesized uh, that are now sort of routinely used to, to make these bilayer constructs. So essentially, the, the general uh, uh, description of these molecules, or the theme is to have a lipid-like moiety, again, synthetically tethered to a linker, in this case, ethylene oxide, which again, of various lengths. These were essentially empirically uh, um, determined as to how what lengths to make in terms of getting these tethers away from the gold surface, and then using uh, double branched lipids, and in one case it's uh, two cases saturated lipids, and then in one case uh, a, a single one bond, one double bond lipid. So again, we want to mimic membranes on solid surfaces. The, the idea of sparse tethering is to get that bilayer away from the surface and it floats, and a lot of effort has actually been placed on uh, reconstitution with as few tethers as possible to have stable bilayers, but to allow the natural fluidity of the membrane. Um, so one of the things that uh, is in process right now to tell you about is the second generation of tethers. And so again, the idea is if you have, uh, one of the, the, the thoughts now is most of those original tethers or single sulfur linkages to the gold. And so the, the second generation of tethers uh, are based on the idea of using uh, two sulfur links to the surface. So basically having two, two, uh, two sulfur linkages here, and in some cases a multi-connected uh, 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 sulfur linkage to the surface, again, to stabilize and also create, in this case, a separation through a branched oligoethylene uh, oxide molecule. The idea, again, is to create, uh, again, more stable linkages here so that one can use fewer and fewer tethers. Uh, that's sort of still ongoing. So how, just to give you a quick uh, uh, cartoon of how this works, essentially to make these, uh, what's nice about these tethered bilayer membranes, and now after years and years of reproducing the same experiment, you can say it's rather routine, is in order to make it, it's simply a two-step process where you mix the uh, the lipids and you get a self-assembled model uh, monolayer. So again, you with a mixture of one of the tethered compounds and the beta ethanol, and you lay it down on your surface. And then you basically add, add your lipids to uh, fill in the, and, and do a rapid solvent exchange with an aqueous buffer. And that basically forces the uh, self-assembly of the bilayer and again, creates this buffer above and below the bilayer. So simply, Self-assembly of the, of the link uh, uh, tethers followed by assembly of the lipid through rapid solvent exchange. So, and so making the lipid bilayers now is actually rather routine. And where we've been for the last couple of years is to, is to really try to advance this platform as something that can be used to study membrane proteins. And this is again where we have the problem, the fundamental problem of oil and water. We have a lipid bilayer that is greasy and doesn't mind being close to organic-like solvents or, or at least uh, alcohols. And then we have proteins which are not happy in those similar alcohols. And so it's a question of how you assemble these, these proteins uh, on, the, on the wild layers. So um, the first thing we were able to do, and there's a couple of examples of this that I'll show you, is uh, you can add, if there's a membrane protein that's, that's associated with the surface of your bilayer, these can be added after the bilayer has actually been formed. And so uh, you can create the bilayer, exchange the buffer, and this, this as I'll show you, has turned out to be a fairly uh, robust and routine way to, to uh, <coughs> measure uh, what happens to memory proteins when they associate with surfaces, um, certain peptides and how they are uh, associated with the surfaces, and in some cases, uh, proteins that can spontaneously associate with that bilayer, like a pore forming uh, protein, uh, can be added after the membrane is formed. So the other, the other, but for most proteins, uh, you have to keep them in a detergent or a lipidic phase as you, uh, to keep them happy. So the question is how you bring a protein that's been isolated in detergent to the surface or in a liposome. And so I'll show you examples of what we're thinking in terms of uh, using liposome exchange with the assembled. Again, you pre-assemble the TBLM, and some examples right now only at the level of exchange that lipids and cholesterol can be exchanged. But the idea would be to bring the cargo to the surface with the liposome, 
And the other uh, uh, approach that we're looking at is tethering, first tethering the membrane protein to the surface, and then assembling the, the bilayer around the protein. So you capture the protein on the surface, and then you basically wash out the detergent with lipids after the food. And that last step actually is, we'll get to, but actually solves one of the interesting, one of the challenges in when you're assembling proteins on a surface is that there's an orientational issue. So if you want your proteins to come in all in one orientation, uh, if you do it randomly, they can be equal likelihood to be up, whatever is up or down, it can go in both ways to your bilayer. Um, so uh, to, transfer, uh, to transfer from liposomes to the surface, uh, there's a, we have examples now uh, from the group uh, where you can basically wash liposomes over the, over the bilayer surface. And if you label your lipids with fluorescent tags, you can see that the actual fluorescence, these green fluorescence uh, dots here, are uh, showing that the lipids actually exchange. So they basically uh, exchange into the membrane and then wash the liposomes off, and you see the residual green fluorescent uh, lipids in our in our in our substrate or bilayer. The other way it's and this has been shown with neutron measurements is basically if you use uh, deuterated lipids, you can show uh, again through scattering measurements and then the deuteration that it's. It's hard to read this, but essentially these, these shaded regions here show you that there is a scattering off of uh, deuterium that's actually coincident with the with the bilayer scattering or reflectometry rather. So this deuter deuteration uh, scattering shows that if you have deuterated lipids in your liposome, that those deuterated lipids are actually getting into the bilayer. And as I said, similar type of uh, exchange experiments have been shown with with, with cholesterol. Um, the other uh, the other approach uh, that we've been uh, uh, pursuing is uh, capture reagents. And so one of the things we thought about is with, uh, things like G-protein coupled receptors or other um, membrane proteins that actually bind ligands. You could actually design a tether-like molecule where you have uh, a capture reagent like an agonist or an antagonist that naturally binds your protein. And then, or you could simply use, it, as you'll see initially, uh, histidine, uh, like an NTA nickel kind of tag on your on your capture agent, and capture the protein on an N-terminal his tag, which is sometimes when you express proteins, you put a series of, of, of uh, histidines at the end. So again, there's two the two uh, examples which, which I'll show you is again for a, a, a GPCR, one could actually grab the uh, CB2. Uh, uh, receptor with its agonist that's actually been linked to the surface through, a, through again, a similar ethylene oxide type lipidic chemistry. And, and again, for just a basic protein, we can do it through a his tag interaction. So the idea there is you bring the protein down to the surface, it's detergent solubilized, and you wash the detergent out as you reconstitute with the, with the lipid, and now you've got your protein, and you backfill the, the membrane around the protein. Again, this, this method actually can address the issue of protein orientation because if you address the protein with a capture region, it should, in principle, only go in one direction. So here's the actual reagents. Um, again, we've, we've looked at, uh, at uh, this NTA type capture reagent if you want to capture a his tag membrane protein. And if you look at that, uh, so. If we just uh, try to capture a protein that's been expressed with a his tag, and we look at our surface plasma residence as a response of protein uh, uh, um, binding to the surface for both our uh, CB2 uh, receptor as well as a, another uh, lipoprotein, we can see that basically there's a, a, a good response between the uh, ESPR and the amount of protein we expect to see as we add it that shows that that protein is actually being uh, coating the surfaces that are created by these uh, capture reagents. So uh, the uh, last uh, I think introduction I'd like to, to give you in terms of membrane reconstitution has to do with creating multi-layer surfaces. And in this case, uh, we've been successful in actually uh, in taking liposomes and actually laying them down in this case to create multi multi layer bilayer. So the liposomes are, are uh, have the protein cargo. In this case, the example would be a, a work with an ion channel. We can create multi layers uh, of this of this bilayer that spontaneous forms from bringing these these liposomes down to the surface. 
so the, the importance of this is if one's doing uh, diffraction uh, type measurements, the multi-layers actually give you, uh, again, a 2D, 2D like pseudo-crystalline structure that one can then use to, to get an understanding of the positioning of the pro proteins in these bilayers and gives you sufficient signal to noise over these multi-layers to actually generate the diffraction patterns uh, that can be used to detect where proteins are in these multi-layers. So this is a this is a, uh, a way to again look at proteins associated with the bilayer through diffraction, where you need the increased signal and the order in the two D labs. Okay. So uh, so when we're doing so now I just want to get into some examples of how we make our measurements and what we like to do with them. So when we're designing protocols for uh, the tethered bilayers and protein reconstitution, at this point it's it's really an empirical exercise. So we want to be able to go rapidly through uh, designing experiments where you can test different possible lipids, different uh, uh, additions of cholesterol, other other kinds of lipids, ligands. Uh, but you want to be able to, to, to test the system with various different conditions. You want to be able to do this and at the same time monitor the membrane bilayer integrity and you want to be able to get some idea of the surface concentration of the components and particularly the membrane protein components. And then uh, ultimately you want to be able to detect the proteins you want bound to your surface for small molecules and then determine some kind of affinity for those surfaces. So you, and again, ideally to monitor it close to real time. So the, there's a number of methods one can use to interrogate surfaces, and the two I was going to highlight today are, are surface plasma resonance, which can give you some information about surface binding and affinity, and electrical impedance spectroscopy, which again gives you some idea of the membrane integrity because it measures ion mobility across the membrane. There are other possible, uh, uh, other kinds of measurements like AFM or uh, TERF, uh, terms of fluorescent measurement where you can look at sort of tracking particles like lipids that are, uh, can give you some idea of the fluidity of the membrane or the movement of the protein, but we won't go into that today. Today, I wanted to just highlight uh, an instrument that has been being built in the lab to look at these two technologies as a rapid way to screen, uh, screen the bilayers uh, for different conditions as we optimize the bilayers for more, for the more sophisticated structural measurements. So the electrical impedance spectroscopy of the tethered bilayer simply is uh, working uh, as a function of the fact that the lipid creates a, an ins a fairly highly insulated uh, system between the solvent and, the, and the, the gold surface here. So you've got a resistance of the membrane and a capacitance of the membrane, and both of those uh, electrical properties are highly uh, sensitive to the integrity of that membrane. If there are defects in that membrane, or or if there's any uh, holes that are in the membrane, uh, these, this uh, um, uh, ion flow will detect it. So and what the data looks like is essentially, it's, it's not really important exactly uh, with the presentation, but what you're measuring is basically uh, in a, an impedance as a function of frequency in the measurement. And these are typically uh, plotted out, so this is simply impedance versus frequency for different preparations of the membrane. And these are typically plotted in a two-dimensional uh, two plot of the real and imaginary component of the impedance. And you get these sort of uh, upside-down curve type structures in this cold cold plot. And again, the important thing for this talk is to show that when you have a bilayer formation, that the impedance response in this, this curve is very dramatic. So this green curve represents the surface before the bilayer, and the blue little curve down here, which is blown up, represents the impedance uh, uh, profile that one expects for a highly insulated uh, uh, bilayer formation of just the bilayer. So the response of these curves, the movement of this curve, and uh, the change in these curves are highly sensitive again to the, to the insulation of that bilayer. So it's, again, an indirect measure of the integrity of that bilayer. Uh, again, just for, by way of brief introduction, because I'm sure most people here know how it works, but surface plasma resonance is another very uh, easy way to look at surface uh, association of compounds or proteins. Uh, you're simply measuring, again, a reflected angle of light and a detection of, of where it meets the, the plasma resonance, and that plasma resonance is a function of what's on that surface, and changes in that surface due to substrates, proteins, bilayers will cause shifts, which can change the angle of incidence, and so you can measure the association of proteins on your 
on your same gold uh, surface. So one of the things that's really nice about this is that the neutron reflectometry, you'll see the surface plasma resonance and the ES, EIS spectroscopy all take advantage of the fact that we build these things on gold substrates. So uh, the, at IVDR, we have a, a, a physicist, uh, Vitaly Sillin, who's building uh, a custom-built SDR ESI instrument. And the idea of this instrument is, so, is to combine both surface plasma resonances and EIS in one instrument and eventually design the cell of this instrument such that it's customized for membrane protein, the membrane protein preparations, and can be easily inserted into our beam lines at the neutron facility. So ultimately, uh, in, you know, in addition to matching the exceeding sensitivity in the dynamic range of commercially available SPRs, the idea is to have an instrument that can rapidly screen conditions when we're optimizing sample preparation, and then be able to measure these things rapidly as we're collecting long data sets on the on the neutron reflectometer. So the neutron reflectometer, uh, it, just to point out, is a measurement that can take 24 or more hours to collect the data. And so it would be useful, first of all, to have a better idea of what you're measuring with these other, you know, the integrity of your surface, the amount of protein on your surface through these other techniques, and then and in principle be able to monitor that in almost real time as you collect the structural data through the scattering measurements. So uh, this is a picture of the instrument that he's built. Uh, it's again, it's a standard, uh, it's not standard, it's an SBR on uh, one component, and on the other side we set up a reference ESI station. So again, for our substrate here, we can collect the, the uh, SBR response and also the electrochemicals response simultaneously. This is some of the specifications. Uh, these are details, but essentially he can, with this instrument, meet or uh, exceed the, uh, the available commercial instruments on a much larger substrate, which is, is designed for the neutron, eventually the neutron uh, facility. The other thing he's, he's developing now is, initially it was a uh, non-flow cell, fixed cell measurement. Uh, to do things like buffer exchange and optimization, he's developing uh, a flow, a flow cell and some uh, crude uh, microfluidics to exchange buffers and things on, this, on the substrate chamber. So again, using this instrument, you can, you can collect your SDR measurements. This simply shows a water buffer exchange. And you can actually look at sample uh, uh, substrate uh, tethered bilayer assembly. And so this again is the, is the substrate when you create the bilayer. It's uh, in red, and then a week later you can see that there's very small changes in that bilayer. So you can measure the, the bilayer integrity and then over time. So one of the things uh, that's useful with having both of these at the same time is, for example, if you make your bilayer and you want to wash the bilayer with ethanol to remove any excess uh, lipids or whatever have you, maybe detergents up there with ethanol, uh, what, he, uh, what you see here is an SPR response as you increase your washes of ethanol. And corresponding here, although it's probably too small to see, but you can actually watch the integrity of the bilayer through the ESI measurement to the point where when you get to 45% here, 45% wash, the, the integrity of the bilayer is lost. So you can actually track, again, the surface uh, material and then the integrity of the, of the insulated bilayer at the same time. So you can actually optimize how you can clean, clean or optimize or watch your system with different solvents without affecting the integrity, again, based on the, on the patterns of these uh, repeated spectra. So uh, the other point I wanted to introduce here was once we, uh, with these kinds of measurements to optimize and build our, our platforms, the, the real workhorse structural tool that we've been employing to date to look at structures of these bilayers is neutron scattering and primarily reflectometry. And so, the reflectometry in some ways is conceptually similar to the SPR. You basically have an instant beam coming in on your surface using the same, again, substrate idea of the thin bilayer. And then you look at the, uh, the reflection of that beam, and that reflection is a function of, of, the, of the chemistry or the, the substrate that, that's reflecting it in the atoms on that surface. So basically, with our neutron facility, uh, we can detect uh, the uh, the formation of these thin films at, at angstrom resolution in the z direction to know how uh, to know something about the structure and projection from the bilayer. 
This is a picture of the diffractometer, uh, reflectometer at NIST, uh, set up on one of the guides. Uh, again, there's a reactor at NIST. Uh, I mentioned that the NCNR is there, and uh, this is just one of the instruments where the, uh, the neutron, cold neutrons are taken off, uh, bounce off your sample station, which again is uh, designed specifically for thin films, and then detected. And again, one of the, one of the things that's in process is to, to uh, place the ESI and SPR instrument in that sample uh, spot to collect all of that data at the same time. So one of the things in terms of scattering experiments that's uh, actually quite useful when you think about neutrons is that neutrons scatter off atoms and, and uh, 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 x-rays scatter off electrons. And if you're scattering off atoms, one of the advantages of the neutrons is that different atoms uh, can be matched to different, different refractive indexes, and so you can actually contrast match your sample. So what do we mean by that? Basically, you can match, this is sort of a visible light example, so if you look at this rod, okay, you can see it in air, but you can't see it in the silicon oil, because the, the light refractive index of the oil and the glass are the same. And the same thing's true with the neutron measurements. There's mixtures of D2O and H2O that can be uh, made to match. And that's Susan Kruger, who's our, one of our uh, NCNR scientists who helps primarily with stance measurements, but uh, this is her slide. So, uh, so basically, if you're looking at contrast variation, what we can do in a complex assembly of a lipid protein system is we can match one of the components and basically blank it from our experiment. So you can match the protein or you can match the lipids. And so you can look at scattering selectively from one or one component of your of your sample. The other thing you can do is you can deuterate your samples, which again allows you to look directly at, at the deuterated sample and, and match it against the protonated uh, components of your uh, your assembly. And that turns out to be very useful again for membrane proteins, where you can you can have uh, deuterated lipids, deuterated proteins, and then various levels of contrast matches where the protein contrast match, for example, around 40% for proteins is very different from lipid head groups and, and, and deuterated lipid head groups. So, so we can actually tune the system to see in principle different components. Okay. So when you're looking at these, again, starting again with the bilayer and again looking at different contrasts, uh, mixtures of H2O and D2O, uh, this is sort of the scattering uh, profile that one can see from the, from the reflectometer. Uh, this can be converted into a scattering length density profile, which essentially gives you an idea of the scatter uh, as you move away from the, uh, from the gold surface. So it's sort of labeled here. You see the scatter from the gold. You see a region which represents the tether scatter, and then the inner and outer leaflet of the membrane can be easily picked up. The head groups are observable, and then the gold solvent. So as you go away from the uh, bilayer, we can see each region as one would expect from an assembly. And so this again just shows us as a cartoon. These, yeah, so the, you've got your gold here, scatter, your tether, which is an aqueous region, which sort of matches the scatter of the bulk solvent. And then you have a differential scattering here uh, from the lipid bilayers, the, the hydrophobic, the, with the hydrophobic uh, tails of the lipids, having slightly different uh, scatter than the head groups. So you can see the head groups, the tails, and then the solvent on either side. So just as a, again, as a summary, uh, we can use these three methods together to potentially, uh, or to gain some information about the assembly of these systems and then something about the structure. And so we use the impedance and the, and the pl uh, surface plasma resonance for, because they're of high sensitivity and fairly rapid measurements to get a sense of the integrity of the system and the amount of material on the surface. And once we've optimized the system using these measurements, the reflectometry can be done with greater confidence. It takes, again, hours and requires much larger samples because of the sensitivity. So again, we combine all those together and get something about membrane. So with that, by way of sort of a long introduction, I'm going to give a couple of examples now of where we were using this kind of analysis on different uh, highlights of different membrane systems we're looking at. So the first uh, few examples I wanted to give were from uh, uh, Hirsch Nanda, uh, who's another um, scientist at the NCNR and who works with us also at IVDR. And so um, 
basically, uh, this slide highlights that in addition to what we have showed you already for using the photometry to look at the bilayers, if we have surface-associated proteins with those bilayers, you can get a, a sense of where the protein is relative to the membrane and, and get a, an idea of the, of the projection of that protein structure on the bilayer from the scattering. Uh, again, using reflectometry, and then you can fit those again to scattering link densities. And so here's just one example uh, where we can, again, using different, uh, basically, uh, contrast matching and then simulations you can get a, a sense of where the bilayer membrane is here, and then there's extra scatter out here, which is attributed uh, and assigned to the protein. So you can get a sense of how much the protein scatter extends out from the surface, its distance from the surface in this kind of a measurement. So um, what kind of questions can you address with this kind of information? So the first uh, example of this I will show you is the HIV gag protein. So HIV gag is a, uh, multi-domain uh, protein that's involved in HIV uh, uh, assembly. So basically at one point in the, viral, in the viral life cycle, the GAG protein is made. It contains a number of modules which are uh, cleaved by the HIV protease, and those modules eventually assemble into a virus particle. Uh, one of the questions that's outstanding is how this viral assembly occurs, and how much does this GAG protein interact with the membrane proteins of the cell, as well as the RNA, which is the uh, genomic elements in the, uh, in the HIV virus. And so uh, what uh, Hirsch has been able to show is, uh, together with collaborators at the NCNI, is that in the absence, so the question of well, how, does the, how does the protein associate uh, with the membrane, they mixed the protein with the feathered bilayers and they saw a confirmation where the protein essentially collapsed with both the matrix and the NC through electrostatic interactions will interact with the surface and create this kind of a structure. Uh, what they found, which was which actually was kind of interesting, is that the, 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 the neutrons, the reflectometry, could not only detect that structure, but if, if a model uh, nucleic acid which is known to bind the NC and then a uh, genomic RNA binding to NC uh, is added, the protein actually, the reflectivity profile changed dramatically and if the protein moves to, the, or moves to this extended conformation, presumably bound by the RNA so that the part of the molecule that was once associated to the NC with the, the bilayer is now extended and bound to the RNA in this extended form. So it shows that in the present, again, and the structure of this protein is actually in a third state when it's free in solution. So it shows that the context, again, of the, of the protein structure in the presence of the membrane is different from the solution. And then in addition to potential ligand partners, you can see fairly dramatic conformational changes in these proteins on the surface. So uh, another uh, example uh, from Hirsch's group is the P10 protein which is basically involved in, in cell cycling and turning the cell cycle off. So it's, it's a, a phosphocase that binds PIP3. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, the most important thing is that it's, it's a membrane-associated protein. So again, the theme here is that the protein has structure was determined. There's a core region of this protein in solution that was found to be highly structured, and then there was a, a disordered uh, C-terminal tail in solution. So the question is, is as a membrane-associated protein, was, what does the structure, how does the structure change in the presence of the, of the bilayer? And it, again, this protein has a lot of implications biologically for cancer, but the membrane ground structure was not known. So uh, what Hirsch's uh, uh, group did was basically, again, use reflectometry measurements together with simulations to look at the scattering profiles uh, above the surface of the, of the head groups of the membrane. And by, a, again, a series of contrast matching experiments and simulations, he could fit his reflectometry data to a model for the protein on the surface, again, and actually define a, uh, a structure, again, through the, sim through the molecular dynamic simulations that could actually fit this profile and brought that C-terminus into close proximity with the rest of the structure. So, I'm sorry, that, that extended from the structure. So, what his model eventually showed in terms of projecting this on the surface of the, of the, of the membrane is that in the case of this protein, uh, if you look at the membrane bound state, there's a, uh, um, 
the primary uh, membrane binding domain here is in yellow, and this C terminus is actually away from it. So the so the C terminus seems to swing away from this uh, membrane binding uh, interaction domain, whereas in solution the simulation showed that this domain actually packed up against the protein and included this membrane binding domain. So the idea here is that the, the two different states of the proteins that they've seen their simulation and through direct measurements on the membrane seem to contradict in some ways what was originally sort of assumed that this being uh, unstructured and or at least not seen in the crystal, that these might, this actually domain might serve a role to pack up and block the membrane associating part of the protein and then in the presence of the membrane that gets uh, kicked out so that they can have a direct interaction. So it's again a question uh, of pointing out a protein structural switch that may be involved to again sequester a membrane, uh, a binding domain and then uh, revealing it upon reorganization. So um, this is early work uh, that I, but I just wanted to point it out because it demonstrates uh, some of the approaches to reconstituting uh, through the capture reagents, but uh, Hirsch's group is also interested in studying uh, the mitochondrial out of membrane proteins. Um, this is an, uh, an, an ionic channel, and it's, it's basically involved in metabolite transfer across the, uh, the mitochondrial out of membrane. Uh, so basically, there's there's uh, an interest in understanding the structure of this protein in the context of the bilayer uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, but why I highlighted here is that what uh, they were able to do is actually use that example that I showed earlier in the introduction, which was to take the, um, the NTA type capture reagents on the goal and capture this VDAC. And basically, once the protein was captured on the surface, they could actually then reconstitute the bilayer uh, in between the protein and create a bilayer reconstituted with the VDAC protein. And this is demonstrated down here if you look at the actual uh, neutron reflectometry. Again, using contrast matching, the VDAC protein could be demonstrated uh, structurally to be on the surface. And then if you, as the, the lipids are reconstituted, the reflectometry measurements for the lipid bilayer actually fall basically on top of the VDAC protein. So you get scattering from the lipids and the protein sort of suggested of this model of the, of the protein uh, being, uh, being basically uh, embedded within a bilayer. Uh, and so we're, uh, this is in the process of now being further uh, validated that this has worked, but it again demonstrates the possibility to, to first generate these surfaces by mobilizing protein and then backfilling with lipids. And the power of the neutrons again to identify those different components selectively to say where we are. Um, and the, the last example I wanted to show from Hirsch's group uh, effort is a collaboration also with, uh, with scientists at IVR is using this idea of uh, uh, functionalizing the surface and then trying to ligate uh, domains together. So the idea is many membrane proteins are very, very hard to express, uh, but the soluble endodomains of these proteins, like for many receptors, uh, can be expressed in very large quantities, and there's lots of crystal structures on these domains, but they're all anchored in the membrane, many with single transmembrane helices. So the idea would be, could one actually uh, insert these uh, transmembrane regions of the protein first, and then link up the remaining part of the uh, protein? So to first demonstrate this, uh, this slide shows that one can actually indeed functionalize the surface with these peptides, and then using, using a peptide that's ended with a, a streptoavidin binding uh, uh, moiety, you could bind the streptoavidin to the top, and you can show that through, again, SPR response that you can actually get this kind of a, a reassembly of a, a transmembrane or transbilical anchored streptoavidin uh, using these kinds of uh, approaches. And again, the idea down the road is to, is to basically use those same kind of anchors and then link them through, a, uh, through a, um, an enzymatic ligation to other more interesting protein uh, structures. Again, the, with the goal of understanding how these receptors ans answering questions or asking the questions about how more than one receptor may dimerize or interact on the surface, questions that are not as easily answered without the presence of the membrane. So, uh, and the, the, the last few examples are from uh, another researcher at IVBR, Ella Mielescu, who's actually here in the audience. So she's right there in the second row. 
and she's she provided me with a few examples of uh, again looking at reflectometry uh, to understand uh, to localize and understand uh, peptide interactions in the membrane. So the first example is uh, there's a number of uh, toxins which interact with the uh, with the cas casein and other ion channels, and basically uh, uh, the, there's a large interest in understanding how these uh, toxins actually interact and inhibit these ion channels. So as you've already seen in a number of slides, uh, one can, this is a, a, an experiment uh, that can be easily amenable uh, to the bilayer. You basically can generate bilayers, add the toxin, and then sort of do reflectometry measurements to sort of ask where does the density come in and where are these uh, peptides located. And so again, they, this was able to demonstrate that the bindings of the membrane and the localization of this toxin was at the surface of the membrane. And uh, so, again, you can further show that, that the position and orientation of that membrane at the surface through to, uh, neutron diffraction measurements can be ascertained. So, again, the, that the, the, the depth to which the, the, that toxin penetrates the membrane and its orientation relative to the membrane could be ascertained from both the diffraction and reflectometry. And again, some of these other curves show you the, the scattering from the lipids, which again are coincident with the where the uh, uh, lipid head groups where the actual toxin is. So again, there's a theme here is that we can see reflectometry uh, isolated to different components and then we can overlay them to see where our different components lay in our system. Diffraction measurements using, uh, in this case, deuteration of selective amino acids can position the molecule uh, orientational wise relative to the lipid bilayer. So you get orientation and sort of extension depth of penetration. Uh, and again, uh, ultimately, it would be uh, the, this work is heading towards trying to understand this uh, toxin again in the presence of reconstituted uh, ion channels. So the other uh, story to tell, I think, is the last story is the uh, story of these poor forming antimicrobial uh, peptides. Uh, uh, uh Basically, they're uh, basically uh, peptides that are from fish. There's a number of homologs, um, and they're so, uh, again for the interest here. There was uh, two variants, P1 and P3. The sequences are shown here with very small sequence differences, but the inhibitory potential of the P1 and the P3 were actually quite different. With the uh, P1 being uh, more active. Uh, against uh, against the coli and the P3. So again, these are these are uh, these peptides are seen through electron microscopy to form to basically disintegrate membranes uh, and, and over time. So the question is though is how they actually do that and how they actually disrupt the membranes is still an open structural question. So uh, again, what Ella's uh, group did was basically look at these peptides uh, together with a collaborator who first was um, <coughs> um, interested in doing, uh, well, for, there were first some measurements done by solid state NMR. And basically, these measurements show that the two peptides were structured similarly. Uh, if you look at one dimension in the turn of 90 degrees, these are similar structures by doing dipolar um, basic NMR structural measurements to get an orientation and, uh, and, and an assessment of that secondary structure of this peptide. So there was there was some data on the structure of the peptides which from NMR which basically did to reveal large differences between the two structures in the presence of the membrane. But what, uh, what, the, what the neutron the photometry that the NOAA did was able to show was that if you look at the scattering of these peptides in the, in the presence of these POPC, POPG, lipids, you can actually uh, see that there's actually quite a different behavior of the P3 versus the P1 peptide. In one case, as was seen in the, in the crystal and the uh, NMR data, these are helical um, at the surface kind of binding of these peptides. This would be the hydrocarbon in pink, the water is in, in blue. But for the for the more uh, uh, effective or uh, higher potency uh, peptides, there's, there appears to be evidence from the, from the scattering uh, that, that these, these uh, peptides are actually penetrating through the membrane. So whether they're forming pores or not, or any more organized structure is still not clear, but what's clear is that the behavior with respect to the membranes, preparations here and 
where you can ascertain their location, uh, again, using uh, using your photometry uh, measurements and, and deleting uh, these deuterated peptides too? Deuterated peptides allow you to localize these peptides in the violin. So again, it gives us it gives us the first sort of indication of how what more the potency differences are here and how those might be related to how they differentially interact with the membrane. Um, and again, one of the things one can do is it's sort of going backwards, but uh, Ella is now working with uh, Vitali uh, looking at the, the SDR and ESI measurements to look at the effect simultaneously of addition of these um, uh, peptides on the, the integrity of the membrane. And again, as I showed before, if you simultaneously add uh, the peptide and take the SPR response, then look at the ESI response, you can track very nicely how the membrane is being perturbed through the electrochemical measurements to the point where you've basically destroyed the membrane. So you can actually track both the concentration of the peptide added as you add it and its response and then the membrane integrity simultaneously. And, and because this is a much faster experiment than the neutrons, uh, you can uh, vary pH and other conditions to look for probing this more for its detailed mechanism. Okay, so uh, with that, I sort of gave you a kind of a broad overview of, of uh, a lot of different projects, but the basic themes of the methods that we're trying to apply. Uh, hoping that if part of today's goal was to try to reach out and think about collaborations. I think one of the themes you can see here is with a set of basic tools, like just, uh, assembling these bilayers, uh, developing uh, these custom instruments for the you know, electrochemistry and for the surface plasma resonance, and the unique capabilities we have in our neutron center, that um, that uh, there's there's lots of opportunities where you can think of projects potentially where there's interest in understanding structure at the surface, uh, understanding uh, membrane responses to proteins as they interact with the surfaces, and understanding. Uh, different kinds of lipid compositions. I mean, so the sort of the groundwork has been laid to, to for all these kinds of experiments, and we do reach out to a lot of collaborators to get these kind of projects going in terms of the biology. Uh, again, I mentioned people as I went through the talk, but a lot of the examples I showed today were from Ella, who's in the audience, Vitali and Dave Vandera, who are involved in the SPR and ESI building. He's our instrument builder at, at IWR, and Dave Vandera is our chemist. Hirsch, Dan Scott, and Dave Hooverheide are, are involved together with collaborators at CMU and NIH in a number of the examples I gave you. And at NCNR, uh, Frank Heinrich and Susan Kruger are the two instrument scientists we're most closely associated with. Oops. And again, uh, just to emphasize that uh, with these tools and with the materials, which we're actually, uh, as long as we have them in stock, willing to share in terms of the tethers, the protocols, uh, these kinds of bilayers have been distributed to many universities and around the globe, uh, both through collaborations and simply through material transfers for people who want to try them for their particular system. So if you're interested in any of this, you're more than welcome to contact me, and I certainly would try to put you in contact with the right person. So with that, I'll thank you and take any questions. <laughs>